you can believe it, it's season finale time here on Elwood City Limits, the Episodic Arthur Podcast. Lucas, it feels like we just started this season. It's already over. I know. I have, we almost need, like, a different name for these because, what is this, five episodes? Four. Four. That's not a season. That's not even a mini series. These are, we're basically watching Arthur OVAs at this point. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe OVA is a li- is a little bit more. Uh, yeah, just des- describes. Yeah, this is as we said when we began this season, uh, season twenty two. This is the shortest one that we've had yet, and yeah, three episodes later, we're on episode four of the season, and it's time to start capping this off. So, welcome to the podcast. My name's Will Young. My co-host is Lucas Mancini. And, uh, Lucas, before we get started on this episode, we do have a few emails that have come in that I wanted to make sure we talk about here. ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com is our email address where you can send us correspondence like some of the people who have today. First off, we have one from Trey who says, On the topic of your farewell message for when you complete the Arthur series currently, will you guys pick this show back up when Arthur comes back? Western entertainment can't let anything die, and no matter how many anti-capitalist activists they hire, there's never been more incessant tricking out of previously established IPs. PBS is no exception. I guess at this point, all we can say is we'll deal with it when and if it comes. You, yeah. Like, if, if we're uh, talking about, yeah. I, I, I don't want to make any promises on other either side, you know. I, I am kind of looking forward to having a little bit of a break, as much as I love the show. Um, yeah. and I am committed to, you know, if there's live Arthur movies and big events, I would love to do little specials or perhaps live streams to talk about those. But yeah. in terms of returning to the pod long term, that's a, we'll cross that bridge where we get to it kind of conversation. Yeah. If, I mean, if like, if we're in our fifties and the new Arthur comes out, it's going to feel a little bit different. Who knows what podcasts are even going to look like around then. So uh, yeah, not committing one way or the other. We'll have to wait and see. But like you said, Lucas, one offs here and there to celebrate whatever new is going on in Arthur would be cool by me. We have one here from Caleb Cote. Now, I will say that I'm going to revisit some of Caleb's email when we talk about one of the episodes, just because I don't want to get ahead of the episode discussion. But Caleb does have another couple questions. Uh, Caleb wants to know our histories with Animaniacs, the show Animaniacs. Lucas. Were you an Animaniacs kid? Uh, I feel like I grew to appreciate it more the older I got. As a kid, it was almost too irreverent. I was yeah. like, these guys need to calm down. <laughs> They're <laughs> scaring me. Um, it wasn't actually scary, but there was something kind of overwhelming and suffocating about it as a kid. As an adult, you know, I've grown to really kind of appreciate it as a classic. Yes, I agree. It really does grow on you, especially both of us being kids of the 90s. Uh, it is, uh, it's, it's funny how much of the humor wasn't really to our level of sophistication as kids. Same with Pinky and the Brain. Uh, I did enjoy Animaniacs when I was a kid. I had the Animaniacs Christmas special on, on video. Uh, wasn't my favorite show, but I did like it quite a bit. Caleb also was asking us for our top 10 cartoons from the nineties. I don't think we have to go through the whole thing, especially because I feel like we have, like from the hundreds of hours of podcasting content and especially given the fact that we've done a bunch of ecl origins episodes about our favorite cartoons from the 90s you could probably scare up your own uh list through just like careful listening you know Mm -hmm. anyway caleb thank you very much uh not to not to dodge the top 10 cartoons from the 90s question maybe we'll revisit that at a different time could be a good question for a stream maybe uh, but thank you, and we will get to the rest of your email later in this episode. One more email here from Marco. Hi, Will and Lucas. As Patrick's only fan ever, I would like to say that there were two references to him in the past two episodes reviewed so far. Uh, anyway, when in When Rivals Came to Roost, when Buster pulls out the jelly beans covered in ketchup, it's a bag from Patrick's Chocolates. But that just extends the question more. Did Buster truly get ketchup all over the jelly beans, or is Patrick just weird? Second is in Binky Can't Always Get What He Wants. 
He's there during the cat adoption show. I've had this information inside of me for the past five years. Somebody else has to know. Unfortunately, these are like the only two references made to him, unless you count the mention in Rhythm and Roots of Arthur, which is one of the specials around this time. Uh, about the actual episodes, I loved Lucas's view on when rivals came to roost. I had never thought of it that way, which is ironic coming from me, a child of immigrant parents. I had already loved the episode for what it was, but Lucas's view made me like it more. I actually don't remember if we see Los Dados again, but I would hope so. I think it's funny for Brain to have a rival. Uh, in this era, you can only really hope. Binky can't always get what he wants is okay. I'm also a fan of Binky episodes, but Lucas is right. It's like a downer, if anything. Definitely at the bottom of Binky episodes, though I think the whole cat adoption thing is more funny than if anything. Uh, why are they letting the kids set everything up? Aren't the teachers supposed to do that? I've worked in elementary schools before. I don't think they would let the third graders put up signs, especially from that height. Maybe it's just the school I worked at, but they wouldn't even let the fifth graders do that. Is the whole thing just ran by Ratburn and the kids alone? Because that would explain a lot. One of the people who cancel last minute is because they're allergic to cats. Ratburn, did you not tell these people you're running a cat adoption show? I think that's more on him, if anything. At least people got their cats. Thank you, Marco. Appreciate your input. And we appreciate the emails from everybody. Elwood City Limits at gmail.com. And of course, we want to also thank the people who are giving us a little kickback at the beginnings of every month for the podcasts at the end of the month. That means our exclusive podcasts that are exclusive to patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. Don't forget our latest one is for the kids and it's and it's on Bear in the Big Blue House. We had a good time recording that, and we're also getting set to record our ECL Origins episode all about Naruto. That will be hitting Patreon shelves soon. So patrons, if you haven't listened to the new episode yet, make sure that you do. And please look forward to ECL Origins. And we want to thank by name some of our contributors, including Revd, JHC, Vinny Cataldo, Gabs, Anthony Williams, RPG Fiend, Rory Forever, Emma, David Corrales, scrolling, uh, Maisie Rose Sterling, and Emily K, Blendy, and Peppy Roo. Thanks, everybody. Oh, uh, Patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits if you'd like exclusive content and to support the show. Speaking of which, bef one more last thing before we get into the episode itself. There was recently a change that we were informed about with Patreon. So if you're going to be subscribing to the Patreon up to the end of this year, uh, please keep this in mind. Starting in November, if you purchase a Patreon membership in the iOS app, the Patreon iOS app, it will be subject to Apple's 30% App Store fee. Now, it's not quite clear how that affects our takeaway, but it does affect how your money is getting spent. So I would just encourage you, if you are going to be a new subscriber in the next couple of months, subscribe through the website. This does not count for anyone who's currently subscribed. Like, you won't be forced to uh, do the 30% app store fee if you're already subscribed to us via phone. I would just say, best bet is going to be the website, especially if you're going to be signing up in, like, November or December. Just wanted to let you all know about that. Okay, now... The season finale of Arthur Season 22 starts with Muffy's car campaign, which surprisingly, I found out, according to the Arthur wiki, much like Mr. Ratburn and the special someone, some local WGBH stations alerted parents that this episode could be potentially controversial. I'm not surprised, actually. This episode... Uh, well, I, I don't want to play my hand yet, but th this was a surprisingly, let's say, overtly political uh, episode of Arthur. Yes, I agree. And uh, it, it, it was funny to think about it first of just like, oh, really? We have to, like, prepare for this? But, well, uh, given the climate of recent years, it might be a little bit more than some parents are willing to show their kids off the bat. But let's let's talk about it. Muffy's car campaign starts off in the lunch line. Mrs. McGrady has created roasted butternut squash with a dash of maple syrup. Now, usually, Lucas, when I'm asked this question, it's usually like a weird food. I'm I, I'm confident you would eat this, right? 
This isn't even weird, Will. The no, it's squash not. with no. maple syrup. This is this is normal food, and I was thinking this sounded delicious. I, I like. I'm not a maple syrup guy, but I would definitely give this a try. Will, and, what, what do you put on your flapjacks? Oh, I don't eat pancakes all that much. Like maybe Waffles. once a year. Yeah, I mean maple syrup, but okay, like that's okay, it. okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. just that like I don't like maple syrup and practically anything else. It's weird. Okay. I just uh, just raised that way, I suppose. Mrs. McGrady, she's trying to serve locally sourced vegetables from local farms, so she's changing up the cafeteria menu a little bit. And we get some overt educational content here, which is not necessarily the norm for Arthur, but Mrs. McGrady is talking about how, you know, when you get vegetables that are not sourced locally, the cars that are carrying them, the trucks that are carrying them, are spreading pollution into the air. And she's tell telling kids about the importance of doing things, of sourcing things locally. And this motivates especially Francine and Binky to do their part to help the environment. Uh, the only other note I had about this is that when Mrs. McGrady, she stops the lunch line and is telling everybody about this, she, you know, she says that pollution can cause diseases like asthma. And Buster takes a puff on his... Uh, his inhaler. Remember when Buster had asthma? <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like we don't really talk about that anymore. <laughs> That's a character thing that is uh, swept under the rug in a way a lot of things in later series Arthur is. But that was actually much, much earlier. So this prompts the gathering of the Lakewood Elementary Eco Kids, but they go through different names, Lucas. That maybe they're the Eco Ninjas, the Eco Squad. What is it later? They're the Eco Compadres. Yeah, Eco Compadres and Eco Ninjas. Those are the the standout names. Eco Kids, not so much. I kind of like Eco Squad actually. Eco Squad. They're soon gonna find out though. As with real life activism, coming up with the name is probably the most fun part. <laughs> yeah, so they go back and forth in the name a little bit, but they're meeting to discuss ideas for how to help the environment. And Muffy suggests a campaign of asking parents not to idle their cars while waiting at school for their kids. And we get this little montage of the kids making a campaign. They even have a slogan, don't make us cough, turn your engine off. And it's quite a it, it's like an immediate success it ha, it gets the effect it's looking for this is also more realistic than buster's suggestion of cars that run on seltzer instead of gasoline careful buster the government might kill him if he keeps uh, <laughs> talking about that <laughs> uh the kids are so this this is a huge success and we see a montage of everybody uh, not idling their cars and like great that's good the next thing the kids are brainstorming, they come up with an even bigger idea about getting more school buses for the school. And then they even talk about the pie in the sky idea of making Elwood City car free, which everybody is into, except for Muffy, kind of like she is not against the idea on its face, but she would obviously be affected by it directly because her father owns a used car lot. And so she has reservations about this. There's this imagination sequence that we have with Muffy where she's walking down the street of Elwood City. Everybody's riding bicycles and riding skateboards and the air is more pleasant to be around. But then we go to Ed Crosswire's uh, Crosswire Motors and he is uh, like comedically destitute. Yeah, no, he's 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 a straight up pauper at this point. <laughs> Uh, it's a it's a great design. I love like uh, poor Ed Crosswire and great performance by his voice actor. Like really sounds desperate. Have you seen some of the deals that he's advertising on the car lot? So it, buy one get one free was one of the ones they focused on. Yep. If I remember, zero percent interest. Ooh. Uh, no p massive clearance. No payments for twelve years. <laughs> and then he's also trying to haggle uh down like just somebody uh some random guy in the street like car for five dollars car for two dollars car for a quarter and he'll throw in this bowl of soup and muffy is just worried that they will be she's worried she seems to be worried about her dad but this will affect her too that they'll be out on the street essentially 
And she kind of floats the idea past her dad of like, hey, if you didn't sell cars, what would you do? And Ed Crosswire says he'd be a dog groomer, except he's allergic to dogs. Uh, I, I mean, animal hierarchy, need we say more? Um, very strange, very weird to hear him talking about grooming dogs. And the other thing is that he um, he is talking about a car that we end up revisiting later, the four-door Mallard. That's the new car that he's going to be pushing at Crosswire Motors. And immediately I was like... Yeah, this is the thing of like, oh, don't mean to say that I'm smarter than the children's show, but I was like, that car looks squat enough to be like an EV, an electric vehicle. But I guess, but I guess it isn't. <laughs> it's As certainly we'll find out later. Uh, it's certainly ugly, like one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Muffy is Muffy's worried about this, and she's going to try to. I mean, sabotage is kind of a strong word, but that is what she's doing. She's trying to pivot the plan from you know, cars as a big environmental problem to airplanes, which she's not wrong about. And the show says as much. Uh, her tagline is, we must refrain from flying planes. Uh, but nobody's by biting on that one. They're going to make a, um, they're going to get a bunch of petitions and then they're going to show it to Miss Tingley, the principal. And that will be their onus to get more buses. So there's a, uh, montage of them going door to door to get petitions signed which is very season one it's funny we just had an episode about like kids not knowing what encyclopedias are or what film cameras are and yet we're doing door to door petition signing not like change.org or something true though it's kind of almost a, a throwback i i enjoyed this kind of uh, there was in all the uh arthur episodes that tackle civil engagement civic and civil i suppose engagement um there is kind of a uh, an earnestness a naivete to the power of children to enact change and if we're gonna live in that fantasy world i'd rather them doing door-to-door -door petitions rather than creating a, a website just if anything else because it's kind of a more entertaining visual that's true. That's true. And it is something more active to encourage the kids to, like, actually be forces in their community. Uh, by the way, reference here to an episode that we would have seen fairly recently. Muffy gives one of her petition signers a box of Tuvaluna cookies, uh, which we saw all the way back in season 19. So she also, their plan is that they're going to present this all to Miss Tingley, and they sort of nominate Muffy. Muffy volunteers. Uh, but she doesn't actually go to pitch the campaign to Miss Tingley. She just lies and said that she did, but Miss Tingley didn't go for it. Francine, however, was watching her and calls her out, and she is kicked out of what uh, Binky calls the Eco Compadres, which is a name that just has that Binky zing. So Muffy is upset about this, and she tells Mr. Crosswire about her whole plan, and now she's kicked out of her friend group. And this is, I liked this scene because it's, Ed Crosswire just, like, being a good dad, especially early, early in the show. He's a bit, he's a bit, you know, he slots into the antagonist role just like Muffy does. But especially in the last few seasons, we do get those moments where it's like, no, he's actually, like, really good with her. And he sits down, listens to her, gives her some of his pumpkin smoothie. And he says that, in fact, Crosswire Motors is doing its part for the environment. He says that the Mallard, the car of the Mallard, is a more eco-friendly car. And he decides to, I guess, basically takes this under his own advisement. He's sort of has a business relationship with the company that created the Mallard. And the episode ends with Muffy, uh, after they have successfully petitioned Miss Tingley, uh, who arrives at school with a fleet of Mallard Car Company electric school buses. So a couple of things here. Yeah. Um, one, um, you were kind of fixated on this tender moment between Mr. Crosswire and Muffy. I yes. was thinking to myself, wow, they were really accurate in giving the Crosswires a fantastic kitchen. I mean, look at that island yeah. with ceramic tile. Um, typical rich person kitchen, not one, but two bowls of fresh fruit. You know, <laughs> this is... an ample cupboard storage to hide all the appliances. This is kitchen you know, Island. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what I'm saying. I, I you know, I've watched a, an architectural digest video in my day, Will, and I was thinking to myself, this is quite the kitchen here. The other thing is 
Well, I'll get into what I think about this electric bus scheme a little bit later on. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I mean, on their face, like, everybody's really pleased about it. And it's like, okay, cool. Like, doing their part for the environment. And then they go off to ride in the electric school buses. And that's the end of, that's the, end of the episode. And now, a word from us kids. And now, a word from us kids. Uh, I don't have much to say about this one. The is like the episode we just watched this class i'm guessing they're like third ish grade or something are having are doing their part for the environment and are having a day without paper so instead of writing things down on paper they say they use like a bunch of paper for like exercises and stuff they are having discussions with each other they use erasable markers on dry erase boards and on tables for their activities and they even petitioned the principal to put more dry erase boards into classrooms so they use paper less. This is a pretty unremarkable word from us kids, I would say. Yeah, it's kind of dry. There's no no standout personalities. It's just like, it's kind of like, that's nice, I guess. I don't necessarily believe that the principal actually did anything after this, but like, yeah. They're weirdly, I'm just going through it now to see if there's anything notable to talk about. Some of these kids, they're filming with like a Dutch angle, which on mute makes them <laughs> look a little bit sinister. <laughs> sinister. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, you, you look for the entertainment where you can, but hey, not all word from us kids uh, are equal in entertainment value. Hey, it's Jason Schwimmer, and I'm from the Finding DW podcast. You can support this podcast by following on Facebook, there at Elwood City Limits, Twitter at ECL Podcast, Tumblr, Elwood City Limits, IG, as the kids say, Elwood City Limits. If you want to send them an email, drop them a line at elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. This podcast, the one you're listening to now, is available on iTunes, on Spotify, YouTube.com, slash Elwood City Limits, and on your favorite podcast platforms. And if you want that extra sweet, sweet content, check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Elwood City Limits. How'd I do? And now, back to Arthur! Last story of season 22, this is Truth or Poll, P-O-L-L. -L. The cold open is pretty straightforward. It's just Binky botching a math test in Ratburn's class. And we see him get into his own head. It looks like he's playing Outer Wilds here. <laughs> if a meteor is traveling at 40 miles per second, how far will it travel in one hour? I really enjoyed this start to the episode. I thought, uh, I feel like it's been a while since we've had a, an intro that really grabbed me. And this visual of Binky with a, on, on a meteor that's only large enough to support him and his desk. And he's kind of flying through the space-time continuum with this giant kind of uh, uh, Dadaist clock uh, yeah. uh, rotating around him, and he's hurling towards the sun. Mr. Rapper's visage appears in the sun. <laughs> this is a good, <laughs> like, kind of classic, absurd uh, Arthur dream sequence. Yeah, I guess Twin Peaks Season 3 there for a second. So Binky does does not even provide an answer on his sheet. He just drew kind of a cool meteor. Uh, by the way, listeners, feel free to check my math on this one. I'm pretty sure the answer is 144,000 uh, miles. I'll take your word it, for it. I'm the wrong person to ask. Binky, and, and, you know, didn't study for the test. He thought that the math test was really hard. However, Ar Arthur and Brain both disagree because they studied for the test and they found it was actually pretty easy. And Brain suggests to Binky that if he wants to, he could take a poll to see what other kids thought of the test. So there's a bit of a sequence here where, like, we really have to go through this step by step with Binky because he starts off by uh, basically creating a rigged poll uh, where it's just like he gets three yeses and it's like, yep, that means everybody thought the test was too hard. And then Brain's like, did you ask everybody in the same class? He's like, N or, or it's like, you have to ask more people than that. And then it's like, well, I asked my mom and my dad and my baby sister. And he's like, no, you have to ask people in the same class. So really the, <laughs> the basics of poll creation. This whole episode, and this isn't necessarily a bad thing, 
But this whole episode is kind of just a Statistics 1000 intro course about <laughs> literally like it, they're using Braid and Binky as kind of uh, analogies and tools to teach good and bad statistics. And that's really what the episode is, which is what a choice for a children's show. Because this really, I have to say, it's it's interesting and it's entertaining Surely this is not applicable to any seven-year-old's life whatsoever. Well, and like, yeah, what what's what eight-year-old is creating polls? I mean, sure, I'm sure there are a few, but like for a mass market cartoon show, I'm not sure. This is also like I think about it now, it feels like we were a bit lacking, and maybe this is the whole thing with it being uh, uh such a short season that like we were really scrambling to fill that educational content uh, quota. I don't, I don't know if Arthur has one of those, but it's just like in the last episode, it was all about environmentalism. This one is all about, like you said, statistics 101. And uh, it's again, it's rare that Arthur is so straightforwardly. Um, I mean, not rare, but I'm not used to Arthur being so straightforwardly educational in terms of like the concepts is trying to get across. Uh, or Again, as we though, said before. straightforward with the educational. Th- think about when we watched uh, Cyber Chase, and we were like, "Wow, this is hard to watch as adults because we have to do mental math, basic mental math." <laughs> you know, what's six times two? Oh, it's twelve. Whoa, whoa. You know? <laughs> but this is like, I don't know. Th- this is like, I feel like maybe this is an indictment of the Canadian education system. I feel like this is high school level math. I feel like you don't get into this level of bad statistical data and good statistical data until far later in someone's education. I certainly don't remember anything like this in elementary school. No, I mean, like, the closest would be, like, fractions. And and again, this is when we were going through elementary school. I don't think I dealt with percentages until at least junior high, if not later. Uh, It's kind of a miracle that I understand them at all. And again, this is Uh, beyond percentages. It's like, and, and again, most of the episodes explaining these concepts, but we get into things like, you know, what is a good question to ask on yeah. a uh, questionnaire to get good data? Um, and, you know, I, I, I work in academia. I know people in academia where their whole job is collecting data, like, in a, a kind of clinical study type of context. And these are the things that they grapple with. So it's just, <laughs> I wonder where this came from, you know, to teach this to a seven-year-old. I really have no idea. Uh, so in the final poll that Binky gets, that he gets right, he asks everybody in Mr. Ratburn's class, 35% say that the test was too hard and 65% say that it wasn't. And Brain has created a pie chart to show the results. Uh, so Binky, I mean, he wants it to be known that it's too hard. So he redoes the poll and he does so in, in two ways. First of all, he tries to bribe. I'm, I'm assuming he does this with more kids, but we see him trying to bribe Buster with donuts. And he suddenly changes the question, as you were saying, Lucas. We, the, ch- the question now is, do you think the test could have been easier, which Brain pokes holes in? Because I think it was like 95% or something say, yeah, it could have been easier, which Binky's like, yeah, so they agree with me. And Brain's like, no, you, you changed the entire answer by changing that question. Uh, Binky keeps going on this poll thing. Uh, he is not able to get strawberry ice cream in the cafeteria. So he offers to do a poll for Mrs. McGrady on the most popular ice cream flavor. And he creates this super rigged poll that a hundred percent of students want rhubarb ice cream. And once again, the question was spurious. The question was, do you want a new flavor of ice cream or no ice cream at all? And so Binky took that to mean rhubarb. And so now it's all rhubarb ice cream, which not everybody really likes, but they deal with it anyway. Yeah, so Binky basically, over the course of this episode, begins to use his newfound understanding of polling data for evil. (laughs) He's kind of like, (laughs) do you remember who Nate Silver was, Will? That name sounds familiar. He was like the guy who was really into data during, um, like... The last American election, he was like, I'm Nate Silver, and I'm all about the data. And he would always be talking about data on Twitter, and, and people started to kind of malign him. Um, okay. And I think he I, – I, I, this is so long ago, it's it's hard to remember what's what. But I feel like he miss, like 
predicted uh, the election where Trump beat Hillary Clinton. He was like, the data shows, blah, blah, blah. And then it turns out the data was wrong. Anyway, I, I think that people on Twitter jokingly begun to really kind of align Nate Silver after that. So the idea of, like, using data for evil <laughs> is, is really funny because, yeah, Biggie realizes that he could y- use leading questions or questions that don't necessarily get good data to kind of... Uh, create whatever narrative he wants to make in all these situations. Yeah, it again w- wasn't expecting this from this episode. There, uh, th- we see a montage of Binky getting everybody's answer to this. There's a very funny drawing of Binky where he's like surprises George. He's crammed into George's locker to get his answer to the poll. It just it, it's it's very it's a very good drawing. Uh, it's also it was strange to me when Binky is Binky asks like Buster, do you like the rhubarb ice cream? He's like, yeah, it's okay. And Binky asks Muffy when she comes by, what do you think of the rhubarb ice cream? She says, meh. And it's like, that's the first time an Arthur character said meh. Like, I'm pretty sure. Mm. It just, again, it just feels like it's a sign of the times, eh? Like, more, almost more so than, like, them having cell phones and smartphones. It's just like, Muffy said meh. It's like, all right. Br- now Brain is taking a poll to counteract all of Binky's polls. So we there's even a montage here of them getting into back and back Back-to-back poll wars. So Brain takes a poll that more students apparently want the Tower of Pain, which is the jungle gym where the tough customers hang out, replaced with a flower garden. And so we see the Tower of Pain covered with all these pots of flowers. Binky does one in retaliation that Brain's chess club should be replaced with video games. And they keep going back and forth with this to the point where that night, Binky has a nightmare where a poll is taken without his consent or inform- informing, asking if he should be baked into a pie, and it gets 100%, because Brain used the question, would you rather have a new flavor of pie or none at all? So Binky is the flavor of pie. And this goes a bit farther than I thought that it would. B- we see Binky, there's like a giant pie in the gymnasium, he bursts from the pie of just like, you know, <laughs> please don't eat me. It's like a it's like a berry pie. And then he's getting covered in like, I think it's I, like ice cream or something as he wakes up. And like the implication is that Binky is killed. <laughs> like he's killed and eaten. Beca- and I like I couldn't stop thinking about like, you know, when you have like a berry pie, like this looked like blueberry or something like the inside of it is very hot. Like that that pie feeling gets really hot to touch. So like Binky's burning to death. <laughs> Yeah, it's like when the the um, magic school bus kids almost got baked in a pie. I remember as a kid, the the idea of being trapped, being miniature within an oven, a convection oven, was really frightening to me. <laughs> um, and speaking of frightening, yeah, this is reminiscent of like, you know, Arthur getting digested by the giant clam or something. This is pretty grotesque. Yeah, and I so I wanted to go back to Caleb Cote's email here. Uh, where Caleb says, I have a concern when Binky has the dream about being put into a pie. Everyone seems really excited to eat him. Why would they want to eat Binky, who is their friend? And also, is this cannibalism? Not to get too dark here, but if you think about it, probably isn't because Binky is a dog. So if someone like Fern was excited to eat him, I guess it would be considered cannibalism. Like, Caleb is a bit apologetic for that, but, like, I was kind of thinking the same thing of, like, why are they it's it's an the reason is because it's a nightmare and like in Binky's nightmare we've seen we've seen stuff before of like he imagines that the kids are very mean to him and this is just like yeah the, you're not supposed to think about it too hard but it is also like they're very excited to eat that Binky pie like it is you're right Lucas like to call back to all of the strange and upsetting Arthur nightmares I'm glad they still got it in them because this kind of this shook me a little bit watching it we basically go into the end of the episode here because in the lunch line the next day, Binky and Brain are going back and forth with their polls and stuff. And then finally, Mrs. McGrady uh, steps out into the lunchroom and asks everyone, raise your hands if you want Brain and Binky to stop doing polls. And even Brain and Binky raise their hands. Like, they, they've they had enough of it. They don't want to do it anymore. However, as the episode ends, Binky says that he'll keep the flowers on the Tower of Pain. He thinks they look nice. And there you go. True truth or poll. And that wraps up season 22. Before we get into final what? thoughts, was yes. it always called the tower of pain? I think, I feel like that's something that they have established in 
episode in seasons around the ones that we've been doing. I I'm going to the Arthur Wiki right now. Uh, the Law of the Jungle Gym, which was in season nine. Okay, so for quite a while. Yeah, then. and I remember that right. being a good episode as well. Tower of Pain, just a great name. It's just good oh, yeah. stuff. It like that was really when we established that that is where the tough customers hang out. So uh, that does, and I guess that name is stuck. But uh, yeah, Lucas, let's uh, let's talk about final thoughts here. You seem to have a bit more to say about Muffy's car campaign, so I'd love to hear what you think. Well, Muffy's car campaign is really interesting because you know there's there's lots at play here, um, and it didn't necessarily add up to an uh, entertaining episode, but it certainly makes one that's interesting for discussion. So, for one, the moment I really like in this episode is the realization where Muffy goes kind of from gung ho to being apprehensive towards uh, the kid's activism because she realizes it will implicate her. And this is something that's very nuanced and can be applicable to all sorts of different contexts, right? And in Buffy, it's not hard to do some legwork and be like, oh, it's all, it could be a class parable too. It's not just that her dad actually owns a car dealership. You know, if, if the kids were doing, I don't know, some sort of like uh, uh, renter's rights kind mm. of activism and, and Buffy's dad owned property, you know, it, would, it would directly affect his livelihood in that sense as well, right? Um, livelihood or lack thereof, you know, Will. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, so I thought this was really interesting and I thought it was an interesting direction for the episode to go to and I was like, I, I wonder how this is going to tackle this about like, or, or even if you make it less black and white, if you make it an episode about how everybody's kind of in to a certain cause and you're just not so into it in your friend group. That's something else that could be really applicable to people's lives. And so I was kind of keen to see where the episode went. Um, and then it kind of, I don't know, it, it's its a little bit of a cop-out that Mr. Yeah. Crosswire just has electric cars. Um, there's a book I'd recommend uh, called <laughs> Do Androids Dream of Electric Cars by a Canadian alternative journalist named James Wilt, where he mm. talks about you know the idea of um electric cars and electric buses are sort of stop measures you know in the interest of capital not to get pretentious here uh but how you know uh public infrastructure is really the main thing that gets cars off the road or reduces emissions and you know making uh uh making uh transit systems free and, and lowering the cost of transit systems uh to the people who use them uh, is kind of the main thing that that reduces admissions and you know electric cars are kind of a last uh, uh, attempt by the car lobby to kind of keep their place um, and not saying that I you know 100% agree with the things that James proposes but I thought that this was a kind of a I feel like they went this route not because it's it's reflective of any sort of reality or anything like that just because it was convenient narratively now I feel like I'm being really harsh to this Arthur episode, but I don't know. I I feel like I'm meeting it halfway because they introduced some pretty heavy, heady and adult concepts. Um, and this is still kind of not a solved issue. You know, the place of the electric car in society and, and electric buses in transit. This is still kind of an ongoing debate. So that's why when you tell me it, it was controversial, it comes as no surprise. But... The way they use it to uh, wrap up this episode narratively, I kind of found out unsatisfied because I don't know. It was just it was just a really interesting route they were going down with. I wonder. I, I'd be happier if it was more about Muffy dealing with the feelings of not agreeing with something that all of her friends were going along with, uh, rather than coming to having this this last kind of dus ex machina that makes the whole thing a moot point anyway. Well, yeah, and it's a little like. In, in real life like not to not to add that lens to it necessarily but it's just like i don't think muffy would be like it's nice that her character is for like being eco-friendly and renewable and all that kind of stuff but it would realistically clash with her lifestyle and maybe even her choices as a person so yeah it, we did have to end it in a place where it's like everybody's kind of okay and uh, we got what we wanted anyway but you're right it, do it doesn't feel t super satisfying I do want to say that for both of these stories, like I think what they're doing, the messages behind them are like strong. And especially with this one, I do think it's great to introduce the idea of um, 
relying less on cars, which it re- we really only kind of scratch the surface. You could go more into it, even in a kid's show if you wanted to. But it is an idea that I think has a lot of merit and we still continue to struggle with in cities today, including Halifax, where we live. Uh, not even just car free, but just like more uh, power to uh, transportation and look and uh, uh, local transportation like buses, public transportation, excuse me. Um, I, you know, like I, as far as an episode, I thought it was like, all right. Um, it was a little bit, yeah, I, I agree with you is that it didn't really end up being all that satisfying. I do appreciate what they were trying to do. And there were some funny bits in there, like the, uh, as, as we mentioned, it was just like, it, it was a little bit out of nowhere, especially when it began with such like Mrs. McGrady, not just addressing the kids, but addressing the kids watching the show of like, like, like pollution is bad. And, and trust me, like growing up in the nineties, like, mm. like cartoons could get really, <laughs> really preachy. The and, ozone layer will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so th- this, I wouldn't necessarily call this preachy, especially because it's a PBS kids show. It's meant to educate. It is just more directly educational than I'm used to Arthur being. And so I had to get used to that for a little bit. And yeah, the episode itself. Yeah. Good intentions. Um, I wouldn't necessarily remember it as like an especially good one. And it's funny, um, talking to you about truth or poll, I think I came away from truth or poll, not really liking it all that much, but in talking about it, I think I like it better now. Like, I, I, I don't know what it is. I, I, I guess just the ridiculousness of the conceit of it, which it's not meant to be taken super seriously. I was, I was thrown off by like, oh, so we're doing like like percentages and stuff and, and, and like uh, misleading people and uh, like like truth in statistics and this kind of thing. I was like this, I, you used the word heady um, for the last episode. And it's just like, that is kind of a lot to expect eight year olds to, to work with. And so like, I appreciate that they did it. It's a little strange, but now that I have a bit of distance from it, I think it's strange in a funny way. Like, it is funny that, like, of all things, Brain and Binky's conflict in this episode is over polling data. Uh, and th- and they do it in, like, really funny ways. It's interesting to even look at it of, like, this... Like, I, I think that people our age would struggle with the idea... Some, some people our age would struggle with the idea of, like, you can totally bork a poll if you want to if you just change the question to suit your own ends. And I think that's actually kind of smart. Um, and they go about it in a very funny way. And there's a little bit of that old Arthur nightmare fuel in there as well. So this actually improved in talking about it. And uh, I think I'm more on the side of like it. I'm uh, still a bit more in the middle, but I am give it more of a, uh, a tepid thumbs up. Because it is just a really strange one. And I appreciate that we still have the capacity with Arthur to get weird with it. You know, we have only had four episodes in this what you would call season. I'm putting air qu- quotes around this. Yeah. And yeah. Um, I, uh, I I think you have to appreciate the gems when they come. And listen, it's a Binky and Braid episode, which is always kind of a fun pairing. Um, and you're right that it's an episode about bad data. And, and, <laughs> and <laughs> how data could be misrepresented. Uh, and it's just so weird. And you're right that kind of in between, there's very little like character work in this episode. It's not like it's about Big Key and Brain like growing and changing. It's just kind of bad data versus good data. And then it's bookended by these kind of bizarre imagination sequences. This is an odd one, like you said. Uh, it's it's like more overtly educational than Arthur tends to be. But again, we're dealing with concepts that we're, we're pretty far away from one plus one is two here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Truth or poll. I just, I, I'm with you, Will, that, you know, I'm not like going to tell people who have never seen Arthur before to watch this one, but for us heads who have seen every episode of Arthur up to this point, it's fun to be surprised and be like, Whoa, what, what's going on here? Um, and so I appreciated it for that. It's it's rare that we're ever surprised by Arthur anymore, which, I mean, just goes to how long we've been doing this. And Lucas, I wanted to take a little bit of time here as we end off the episode to just remind everybody and ourselves, like, this the week that this is releasing on Patreon, 
eight years, man. Wow. Like this is our this is our eight year anniversary of Elwood City Limits. Eight years, well, and you know, uh, first and foremost, we have to thank all the dear listeners. Yes. Uh, we wouldn't have done this for eight years without you. If we had never gotten an email, this probably would have fizzled out years ago. So, you know, all the emails, all the people that contribute to the Patreon, um, that's what really keeps us going. And then, of course, secondly, I, I must thank you, Will. Will puts it, you folks might not see it or hear it, but Will puts a ton of work into the show. And it, you know, with my busy schedule, it wouldn't happen without Will uh, picking up some of my slack. And so I'm so appreciative to that. And of course, the the um, just what an amazing co-host you are as well. So uh, I think anything, any project that can last for eight years is, is worth commending. Uh, and it's just, you know, I think we deserve these patting ourselves on the back, Will, as we head towards the home stretch here. Yes, I mean... We we say that we say this every year around this time. The first episode of Elwood City Limits aired August nineteenth, twenty sixteen. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I'm sure there will be a lot more to say in a few months once we've wrapped this up. And in case you're, I don't mean to spring that on anybody. It's like we did put out that announcement on the free feed everywhere. So if you weren't aware, like go listen to that for a bit more details. But yes, once we finish up with Arthur. Elwood City Limits as a podcast is going to at least go on to the back burner. I don't think we are going to truly abandon it, but it's, you know, we're going to finish up regular uploads. And as Lucas said, it will be, it'll be good time for a break for a little while. But until then, like, I'm so pleased every, every year, every year around this time for the past eight years, I've, I've spoken to you, Lucas, and, I've asked, do you want to keep doing this? And, and like, I figured maybe in, like, year three or something, there would be a time when you're like, okay, yeah, I think I'm done. And I'd be like, yeah, cool, I understand. We can't do this forever. I never expected us to get th- this close to the end. Like, we're not there yet, so I don't want to counter chickens or anything. But it's been a wonderful experience. Um, you know, I, I feel like I go into this every year, so I'll keep it short. And echoing Lucas's thank you, for everybody who is listening to this, whether on the Patreon or the free feed, and to you, Lucas, because I strongly feel that, I mean, you, you've you said as much of, like, if we didn't get an email, this wouldn't keep going. If we didn't, if you and I didn't get along, like, this wouldn't, um, this wouldn't have gone as far as it did. I strongly believe that if this was just me, or if I had picked somebody else to be co-host, it wouldn't be as good. And I think that, and this is not to downplay my own efforts, but I think that you being here for these eight years has made Elwood City Limits into the strong show that it is. And I firmly believe that because there's nobody else like you. You are uniquely funny and insightful, and it's been uh, it's been a treat to do this for eight years, for us both to grow up alongside each other. And that whole time, you have been the spark that this show has always needed. And I'm so grateful that I got to do that. I am still doing this show with you eight years later. So thank you as much as you thank me. Oh, well, thank you. Will. and if you liked that folks, the, uh, the mutual glazing, the glaze fest <laughs> going on right here, uh, stay tuned for the, uh, next few months because we are at the hashtag end of Arthur tour. <laughs> we are barreling, towards the hashtag end of Arthur. So there's more glazing to come. And I hope you all enjoy it. <laughs> That's right. Hashtag the end of Arthur. And yeah, but hey man, we've got a lot more, a lot more to go. Thank you for listening to this episode of Elwood City Limits. Uh, coming up for you very soon, as we said on the Patreon, we're going to be getting into no- some Naruto on ECL Origins. You'll get a preview of that on the free feed. And uh, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have a good time talking about that. I'm very excited, uh, and it's excited to find out uh, Lucas's relationship with this because this is a another suggestion by him, and I'm I'm eager, especially the episode we've picked out. I'm very eager to see that again. It's like the only episode of Naruto that I think I've watched in full. So uh, yeah, we I think it's gonna be a good one. Uh, So that's coming up. We're, of course, going to have a recap episode of season 22 that will be coming your way probably near the end of the month. As I said, I'm going to take a take a week off for my birthday at the end of this month. So we'll give you a recap episode and that will be available on the free feed at some point as well. Uh, 
again, <laughs> I think it's going to be more like a top three episodes. Uh, I've got I've got three. Lucas, no pressure for you to get three if three didn't make the cut. But let's just say top episodes, and we'll see where it all shakes out. And then we'll be getting into Arthur season season twenty three. The next time we're here on Elwood City Limits, and we started off with Fright Night and Citizen Shake. So the return, just like just in the title there, the return of a character we thought maybe we'd never see again. I have it on good authority. Uh, there's going to be quite the special guest coming in one of these uh, episodes. So be prepared for that. Lots to talk about with Arthur and with our Patreon content and more as we continue barreling towards, as Lucas says, hashtag the end of Arthur. And we will catch up with you when we catch up with you. For now, that's Elwood City Limits. My name's Will Young. And for Lucas Mancini, what will I have with my fresh burrata? <laughs> we'll see you next time. It's a question I often ask myself when no tomatoes are available. What's a burrata? It's a it's a type of this is okay. If, put this after at the very end of the show. This is a little yeah. extra for all the listeners. Okay. Yeah. Burrata. It's a type of cheese. It's like a mozzarella. It's an Italian cheese. Ooh. Um, okay. But uh, I've once watched a video <laughs> about how burrata is made, and it was the most Italian thing I've ever seen in my life. The Italian chef was like, a burrata, it should uh, I feel like a, the breast of a beautiful woman. <laughs> <laughs> so how do, you, how, do you, how, do you, how do you spell burrata? Let me look up on uh, Google image search here. Oh, there it is. Yeah, that, it's a pretty funny gag in the episode because they cut to her bra. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I guess it kind of... Yeah, all right. No, I'm not going to finish that thought if this is going to the episode. <laughs> all right, I'll stop recording now. <laughs>